We are starting with the third session, Fundamentals of Diabetes. Uh, I would like to invite uh, our chairperson for this session, Dr. Sashank Paswala and Dr. Krishna Mori from Rajkot. We welcome you, sir. I request you to introduce our the first uh, speakers for the session. Okay. You need to put okay. on your mic is mute. Yes, yes. yes uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Swasim team, for this opportunity. Uh, as we know that uh, even in the last 30, 40 years, a lot of medications have been come up in the therapeutic armamentarium. The basics of diabetes remains the pillar of all the treatment. And today we have none other than the three doyens of uh, diabetes and endocrinology in their own right, definitely. And some of the uh, few of them, the teachers of our teachers. So first of all, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Rakesh Sahai, sir. Sir is a senior consultant endocrinologist from Esther Prime Hospital in Hyderabad. And uh, uh, he's also the president-elect of Endocrine Society of India. Uh, we welcome you, sir. So thank you. Thanks to the chairpersons. And at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mayur Patel, Dr. Yash Patel and the entire team at Swastikon for inviting me uh, to speak on this uh, on this uh, topic on basic sciences of diabetes also a futuristic topic i would say because i'm speaking about uh, preservation of beta cells which is always a a a, a sort of uh, a goal that we are all looking forward to looking towards and uh, today i'll try to say uh, to to uh, show you some uh, data on what is happening in this area of beta cell preservation uh, in patients with diabetes and how it is going to impact our management of diabetes so let me share my screen so uh, so i thank uh, once again thank the organizers for giving me this topic because it has given me a chance to also look into this because this is something which we don't uh, see in our day to day practice we don't uh, uh, really uh, really uh, sort of uh, um, use it in our day to day practice so it has given me a chance to review all the data on this uh, on this aspect and and it has uh, helped me in updating myself about this important area so if you look at uh, diabetes we know that diabetes is growing in uh, leaps and bounds it's a major public health challenge today we have more than 450 million 440 million people or even more than that with diabetes across the world and and we know that majority of it this is type 2 diabetes 5 percent of this is type 1 diabetes and if you look at uh, the contribution of 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 uh, the various factors that contribute to the development of diabetes we see that beta cell dysfunction or beta cell loss is an important contributor to towards the development of diabetes in type 1 diabetes it's a major factor we can say that that's a major reason why people develop type 1 diabetes they have got autoimmune destruction of beta cells uh, while in uh, people with uh, type 2 diabetes there is a relative again there is a beta cell dysfunction unless they develop beta cell dysfunction they do not develop uh, develop diabetes so uh, that again is a contributing factor and what we see is that uh, the available therapeutic aspects uh, or, or the therapeutic agents or uh, or the lifestyle uh, changes and all the medications that we are currently using are able to, we are able to only get 30 percent almost one third of our people only to uh, to reach the ta targets that we are uh, we are looking at and so therefore there is need to look at more uh, doing beyond this trying to see whether we can actually reverse the beta cell uh, loss that happens in patients with diabetes so this slide basically gives us an idea about how the uh, uh, how type 1 diabetes develops the timelines rather you you can see that uh, even type 1 diabetes which is generally assumed to be a acute event with generally with DK, D, diabetic ketoacidosis or severe osmotic symptoms is also preceded by a large period of pre-diabetes as you can see here uh, on the left panel you can see that there, there is a uh, prevalent i mean there's a large period of i mean or a long period of pre-diabetes even amongst patients with type 1 diabetes in type 2 diabetes obviously we are aware of the fact that there is uh, insulin resistance developing earlier because of which there is increase in beta cell function increase in beta cell mass and increase in beta cell function initially which makes the which keeps the uh, glucose levels in the normal range and then subsequently there is a decline in the uh, in in the beta cell uh, in the beta cell mass that happens oh, and that leads to the development of diabetes so much so that it is said that at the time of diagnosis of diabetes almost almost 50 percent of beta cell function is is already gone by the time people develop type 1 diabetes and by the time in the next few years there's there's further progressive decline in beta cell mass so there is a difference 
in the beta cell mass in type 1 and type 2 diabetes and uh, in type 1 diabetes it is said that uh, even though we say that uh, the beta cell function is completely gone but autopsy studies have shown that there is there are uh, at uh, autopsy studies in type 1 diabetes have shown that 2 to 40 percent of beta cell function is still preserved in in many of these type 1 diabetes so there is a scope what we what i am trying to highlight here is that there is some amount of beta cell uh, uh, mass which is left even in type 1 diabetes and there is a scope for uh, for for regeneration of this of this mass of beta cells also now when you look at type 2 diabetes uh, however you see that i mean and in type 1 diabetes therefore there is because the uh, uh, a significant amount of beta cell mass is lost there is a role for whole uh, pancreas transplant transplant of selected uh, human uh, pancreatic islets and transplant of embryonic or pluripotent stem cells which are programmed to develop into beta cells so all these uh, research is going on but uh, there 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 uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, promise uh, but there are several challenges and controversies in in this aspect now this uh, picture again depicts how uh, the beta cell mass in type 1 and type 2 diabetes differ in type 1 diabetes on the left panel again we see that there is just uh, hardly any beta cell mass left whereas in type 2 diabetes a significant amount of beta cell mass uh, which, which is preserved but still there is a loss as compared to non, non diabetic individuals and the loss in beta cell mass in type 1 diabetics is because of genetic predisposition to lower it may be because of genetic predisposition uh, due to which the uh, reduced beta cell mass is seen even they don't reach the uh, reach their complete attain uh, attain the uh, idea i mean uh, the amount of beta cell mass that should be achieved that is shown in jiva studies inadequate beta cell mass during fetal life and childhood and also the other important aspect which has to be understood is that there is de-differentiation of beta cells uh, towards other cells and that is done by uh, induced by glucotoxicity lipotoxicity on endo or endoplasmic reticulum stress so all these mechanisms which we say are contributing to development of diabetes are actually doing it by causing de-differentiation of the beta cells into others other cell lineages and that is the reason why we say that there is uh, there is a, a a need for uh, looking into all this so now if you look at the beta cell degeneration uh, regeneration what we found is that human body has limited capacity to regenerate new cells or tissues after birth as the genes involved are switched off the genes involved in in the regeneration are actually switched off this process happens because of dna methylation which can which activates cell cycle inhibitors and inhibits the cell cycle activators cell cycle activators now if you uh, and the major genes which get inhibited or or get activated and uh, get switched off uh, D, uh, which genes get methylated as ngn3 sox11 are 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 the ones which are uh, the dormant repair cells and they become dominant uh, dormant after methylation and demethylation of these can lead to reawakening of the progenist uh, progenitor cells and uh, and beta cell uh, regeneration can be activated through those mechanisms so what we see is that uh, uh, in patients with type 1 diabetes the other additional uh, point is that even though if, if we are working towards beta cell regeneration we still need to work on on seeing that these beta cells which are regenerated are protected from the autoimmune destruction which has happened initially which has led to the development of type type 1 diabetes so there is a need for not only combining this beta cell replacement or beta cell regeneration with uh, with uh, uh, therapies which are able to suppress the immune response so there is a need for developing and and even in type 1 uh, type 2 diabetes uh, there is a need for regeneration of beta cells so what we are saying is that in type 2 diabetes uh, there is a need i mean in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes there is need to study whether we can regenerate the beta cells what are the kind uh, drugs that can uh, uh, which can work on this uh, beta cell regeneration and several can candidate drugs as you can see the list whole list of uh, growth hormone pth related peptide hepatocyte growth factor um, uh, glp ones and everything uh, all of these have been actually studied but the most promising results are probably with the last one as you can see here in the last line you can see these are uh, the dual specificity tyrosine regulated kinase 1a so i'll call it for short i'll call it as dirk a dirk 1a dirk 1a so i'll i'll call it for today's discussion i'll call it as dr dirk 1a so the, this dirk receptor dirk 1a uh, inhibitors have been shown to reproducibly increase the replication of human beta cells at rates in excess of 1%. So this is the one which has shown maximum promise although several of these have been studied. Now let us discuss a little more about these um, these drugs. So, so the dark one inhibitors uh, are, are the most common ones which have been studied out of those are the harmin. 
Harbin is a uh, which has been studied in human islet cells also and has been studied in Roman rodent models. Others have also been studied. Um, other other medications have also been studied. Even osteoprotogerin and denosumab, which are drugs which are uh, closely related to the bone development, have also been studied in in uh, relation to, to beta cell uh, development. Now looking at the dark one a inhibitors, we have uh, Harbin that is the most um, one which has been studied extensively. And there are others also, Indi, Indi and uh, Leukocetin uh, 41 and all the others have also been uh, studied in different, uh, different uh, by different researchers. 5IT is also one which has been studied extensively. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, basically show you some data, some st data, data from this uh, uh, studies on Harmin. So uh, the other point that have to be that has to be understood is that before we go forward is that. Um, if you look at beta cell regeneration, it can happen through proliferation of the, of the existing beta cells. It can happen uh, because of differentiation of the uh, de-differentiated beta cells. The beta cells which have undergone de-differentiation, if, if they are promoted towards the pathway of differentiation towards beta cells, that can also improve the beta cell mass and also through trans-differentiation of other cell lines towards beta cell lines. So these are the various ways in which we can uh, regenerate the beta cells. And as you can see here, this is a little busy slide, but what you can see is that uh, basically it is showing the how proliferation would be, uh, would have some pros and cons. There are always pros and cons of this. Differentiation has some pros and cons. And, um, and and also the other aspect that is trans differentiation has some pros and cons. So this is actually a extensive area of discussion which I would not be able to cover in this uh, 15 minutes that are allotted to me. So I just I just wanted to show you that this these concepts or each of these uh, aspects has uh, certain advantages and disadvantages. But I'll basically speak about the uh, the beta cell proliferation today. So if you look at the typical proliferation, how do you assess that? You can assess by using immunocytochemical and immunohistochemical measurement of cell cycle <coughs> or DNA synthesis. It's not a longitudinal um, a measurement, but what you're doing is that you're looking at these uh, at these markers uh, which are present in cells which are replicating. So if, if these markers are seen, then we say that, oh, these beta cells are, are proliferating. Although there are limitations, fallacies to this, there may be some limitations in, the, in terms of, you know, not exactly knowing the uh, extent of proliferation, but this is what is uh, generally used to understand how beta cells are proliferating, whether beta cells are proliferating. And uh, there is labeling and detection of human beta cells by uh, facts amongst uh, mixed human islet populations and quantifying the number of beta cells in control and drug treated samples. So by these uh, by these studies, uh, the, this way, the, the beta cell proliferation is studied. Now, what is normally happening is that the beta cells are quiet. I mean, they are not undergoing differentiation and they are in a stage of stage of cell cycle arrest, which, which you said is because of different reasons. One is because there could be a lack of the stem, stem cells or there could be, uh, there could be uh, uh, senescence and local, uh, uh, local senescence of the cells or it could be because of other factors as we spoke of other factors which are suppressing the, uh, suppressing the beta, cell, uh, beta cell proliferation. And, uh, and so therefore the DNA methylation as we said, DNA methylation and chromatin assembly, accessibility being affected because of epigenetic changes, they, they actually cause the beta cells to remain in a state of quiescence. Now the other uh, one more aspect which I would like to highlight here is that uh, uh, if you look at the uh, human beta cells versus rodent beta cells, rodent beta cells tend, tend to have a higher rate of proliferation um, in their in the in early years of life and also in later years of life, uh, but which is much more than what we see in the human beta cells. In the human beta cells, in the first year of life only, there's highest rates of proliferation are seen. That's generally to the tune of about two to three percent, as you can see here. Uh, human beta cells, uh, two to three percent proliferation rates in in the first year of life and then that goes down quite significantly in mouse models they, the proliferation rates are into the tune of about 50 percent seen in the seen again in the early life but later on life but most of the times the studies have used older mice to look at the beta cell proliferation now uh, coming to the uh, area of dirk 1a inhibitors and how they have how they have produced this uh, beta cell uh, uh, regeneration was first studied in 2012 by Anis et al and subsequently in 2000 between 2015 to 2020 multiple groups have actually studied these different uh, inhibitors like harmin indiva indi and the leukatin uh, 41 and all the other ones which i said that and they, they have shown that these are able to induce human beta cell to replicate this is because what happens is that this dirk one is a kinase that phosphorylates a number of substrate proteins among which the nuclear factor uh, nuclear factor activated in t cells 
family of four nuclear transcriptors that is n n fat is the nuclear factor which is activated which is uh, which is activated uh, and these these actually suppress the uh, beta cell uh, uh, replication uh, or the beta cell regeneration so suppose now we uh, we have this inhibitor derk 1a inhibitor then that actually allows the allows the uh, beta cells to regenerate so that is basically what happens and uh, now what we have seen is that uh, when they've used uh, derk 1a inhibitors they've shown that uh, there, there is proliferation of the of the beta cells and that is uh, produced by inhibition of derk 1a and also derk 1b also this is also inhibited by the same uh, same uh, 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 molecules which we spoke of just now so inhibit the derk 1b also and both of them actually cause any uh, cause proliferation of beta cells now uh, uh, the other important thing that we see is that uh, the uh, in the inhibit inhibition efficacy of derk 1a itself may not be enough to produce enough uh, proliferation what they do is they they increase the proliferation from from less than 1% which you have seen in in uh, human uh, uh, islets it uh, gets it into the range of 2 to 4% so this is how they increase the rates of uh, proliferation of the residual beta cells and now what what has been uh, looked at is whether we can combine these derk 1a inhibitors with other drugs to increase the proliferation rates so two different uh, drugs have been or two different uh, molecules have been studied in this one, one is the tgf beta super family inhibitors have been studied and when both of them them are combined like harmin from the derk 1a inhibitor uh, which increases it to 2 to 3 percent when it is combined with tgf beta super family uh, uh, one of the inhibitors it increases to almost 15 to 18 percent so there is a increase in beta cell uh, proliferation to that extent of 15 to 18 percent which is which is extremely good but there is a concern that they could be uh, that tgf beta inhibitors could have a lot of undesirable off target effects because they they involve in sev several cellular processes and therefore uh, a more uh, uh, more more safer uh, molecules were looked at uh, they have looked at sulfonylureas and uh, and the megalitonides but they did not show any promise in terms of increasing the beta cell proliferation but when glp1 analogs were used they were showing that you could increase that once again from the 2 to 3 percent seen with uh, seen with derk 1a inhibitors to uh, 20 to 30 percent with any of the glp1 analogs that is uh, liraglutide lexacinatide hexanitide and semaglutide so maximum number of studies were done with hexanitide but they have been seen with all the other glp1 analogs so uh, the derk 1a inhibitors along with glp1 analogs have been shown to improve the um, um, improve the beta cell function and also the number of beta cells have also been shown to increase in 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 uh, vitro studies from the in vitro studies they have also looked at in vivo in human beta cell numbers uh, a cultured human beta cell numbers and they show that the numbers could be increased with only four days of treatment there was a significant increase in the number of beta cells now uh, when these are uh, when these are uh, put in vivo into into uh, human islets transplanted into immunocompromised mice there again you could see a improvement in the number of beta cells and therefore they, this give, gives gives us a hope that there is a scope for this uh, this molecule to work in terms of uh, in inducing the beta cell proliferation now the other aspect is that harmine also induces human beta cell differentiation that is those cells beta cells which have been go gone into quite quiescent state with the de differentiation they can be differentiated towards active beta cells and that again is a, a, a fact as aspect which can improve the beta cell function so how much is enough how much is required beta cell function which we said just now that uh, we can see that uh, there is a improvement in beta cell function with uh, with this use of harmine and tgf beta from two percent it goes up to about five to seven percent but in vivo what we see is that while in uh, in vitro these are the results but in vivo the results are are smaller but yes they are there but they are smaller and what what is again a controversial area is how much proliferation is required how much is in, uh, required to to really uh, bring about improvement in the clinical improvement in type 1 and type 2 diabetes so that is something which has to be studied further and we are looking forward towards more and more uh, information on this aspect and the other aspect is is beta cell proliferation alone enough to cure uh, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes in type 2 diabetes this may have a uh, a, a better uh, scope because uh, you are you are looking at a deficiency of beta cell which is not very severe but in patients with type 1 diabetes where there is a very significant deficiency of beta cells there there probably uh, the, the re response may be a little lesser 
now the other aspect is that um, is it cost effective yes because what we are seeing is that for the transplants and other things which cannot be afforded to i mean which cannot be offered to the entire population of type uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes so whereas this is uh, something where you are using a small molecule and you are likely to get uh, benefits which are which can be translated into clinical improvements now uh, will there be any additional classes of human human beta cell proliferative drugs yes we have um, we, we 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 are seeing that there is a uh, improvement and this I, I mean there is a lot of new work going on in this area and the scenario has changed over the last five years so we we expect that there could be more and more uh, uh, work on this area in with the with the interest from pharma biotech and academia this will produce yet additional beta cell regeneration uh, regenerative compounds may may come into the picture and we may see a hope in the uh, coming years so having looked at that let me then uh, quickly uh, discuss about uh, the scalability and cost so while while we see that uh, um, the combination of harmin glp1 receptor uh, glp1 analog uh, is probably the best combination which enhances beta cell differentiation and function it will probably be particularly attractive in the setting of uh, type 2 diabetes whereas in type 1 diabetes it may not uh, it may not be as attractive as it is in patients with type 2 diabetes so finally uh, having taken you through this journey of uh, beta cell regeneration and uh, the differentiation i would conclude by saying uh, giving this take home message that the past 5 years have witnessed a sea change in beta cell regenerative therapies therapeutic human beta cell regeneration until very recently had been viewed as a inconceivable and impossible uh, target but now we can see reasonably we can see that there is a possibility of uh, this be becoming a therapy uh, becoming a, a area of uh, area of clinical use in the next half decade or so we expect to see more important advances in beta cell therapy biology and pathology pathobiology medicinal chemistry type 1 diabetes immunology type 1 diabetes therapy preclinical safety studies and early human trials with the dirk1 inhibitors along with the glp1 analogs is expected to uh, come into the come into picture and we are likely to see some changes in the coming years thank you all for the patient hearing over to the chairperson uh, we thank you rakesh sir uh, it was a wonderful talk uh, uh, doing uh, with justice in just 15 minutes for such a complex topic uh, moving on in the want of time i would like to introduce dr sv madhu sir uh, who is uh, belongs to the uh, department of uh, endocrinology metabolism and medicine in ucms and gtb hospital uh, new delhi is uh, he would be talking on atherogenic risk in diabetes mellitus the newer perspectives uh, we welcome you sir over to you sir uh, thank you and uh, i thank dr mayur patel and all the organizers for inviting me for this talk and let me just share my screen and we'll move ahead we have a, one question from the vishal we can address at the end of session sir okay can i start uh, yes sir please sir you can start you can start oh, okay so uh, you know today i'll be speaking on uh, you know the atherogenic risk in diabetes mellitus which we all know is um, uh, higher than in the non diabetic population but we'll talk of some of the newer perspectives and some of the areas of uh, research that we have done in this in this particular um, uh, area and uh, and then conclude by looking at these perspectives the broad outline would be you know traditional diabetes related atherogenic risk factors what do we know about them prevalence of uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia in particular in india and the consequences the drivers of atherogenic dyslipidemia in particular and the newer uh, factors which might be of consequence testosterone deficiency cv risk uh, monocyte cd36 expression and atherogenic burden in diabetes and to some extent age range and the uh, genetic polymorph polymorphisms related to that and diabetic microvascular disease so some these are some of the newer perspectives that i would like to touch in the next 15 minutes or so this is the traditional thing right from the insulin resistant stage in the pre diabetic um, uh, situation of igt through the diabetic situation and even the later stages there is a close relationship between diabetes and atherosclerotic disease and and chd and amputations also in the later stages as we all know so they go both hand in hand and these are the various traditional risk factors as we all know and uh, particularly important in this would be the uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia which is the most important as we'll see and this in diabetes particularly leads to cardiovascular disease and we all know that insulin resistance uh, through various mechanisms particularly the lipids and other associated factors would result in atherosclerosis 
and the progression of these atherosclerotic events occurs in diabetics through various mechanisms, including insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, inflammation, dyslipidemia, infections, and the thrombotic events. With that basic background, which we all know, now this is the study the in Diab, which actually showed very clearly that the you know the the risk of dyslipidemia in the Indian population is huge. It's nearly seventy nine percent, most of which is low HDL, seventy two percent, next followed by hypertriglyceridemia, and therefore, as far as India is concerned, there's an important and urgent need to focus on lifestyle intervention and other measures to prevent and manage this important cardiovascular risk factor. Talking of, you know, hepatic fat as the driver of atherosclerosis, the adiposity, high carbohydrate diet, insulin resistance, and the genetic predisposition decides the TG pool or the hypertriglyceride state. And if it is low, you go to the upper path shown in the half of the upper half of the cartoon pattern A, where there's large LDL formation. If the TG pool in the liver is high, this is the path that is taken with small uh, dense LDL and the smaller HDL, the pattern B, both of which are atherogenic, as you can see, as the TG levels increase, the size of the LDL particle decreases. So driver is the hepatic fat and probably triglycerides. With that background and triglycerides being brought into focus, these were some of the studies that we have done over the years looking at postprandial lipemia because it's said that triglycerides, while they're important, have not been consistently been associated. And it's actually the low HDL, which is probably more important. But once you look at the postprandial triglycerides, it becomes far more important than even the HDL. And this is what we showed as an emerging risk factor. And now it's almost an established risk factor. And from our Indian studies, we'll find that in diabetics in particular, you would find significant postprandial triglyceridemia as shown in this slide, which is also seen in pre-diabetic states like pure IFG and pure IGT in the newly detected diabetic population. And you can see a graded increase from NGT at the bottom through pre-diabetes and to diabetes at the top. So we've basically shown that, you know, Indian type 2 diabetics and even the pre-diabetics have significant abnormalities of PPTG metabolism. And therefore this could be a significant cardiovascular risk factor among Indians. This was a study uh, by Tino et al, which actually showed that, you know, there is a link between a high TG and CIMT and therefore a closer association uh, as an important independent risk factor for atherosclerosis. More recently, we've uh, shown that postprandial hypertriglyceridemia is seen particularly so in those with microvascular disease in diabetics, and therefore probably this sets off a proatherogenic environment, which leads to atherosclerosis and microvascular disease in these subjects. We also showed that following a fat challenge, there is significant postprandial oxidative stress in type 2 diabetic patients with macroangiopathy, the yellow. And we also showed that this is very closely correlated with the postprandial TG levels, and therefore the postprandial uh, oxidative stress is probably linked to the postprandial triglycerides. And we all know that uh, excessive ROS formation or oxidative stress is definitely associated with higher cardiovascular risk. A more recent publication actually shows the postprandial endothelial dysfunction and CIMT after oral fat challenge in type 2 diabetic patients, particularly in those with microvascular disease. As you can see in the bottom two cartoons that you have significantly elevated uh, endothelial dysfunction, particularly in the postprandial phase, uh, which actually shows that you know uh, there is significant endothelial dysfunction, and this increases across the board, more so in those with microvascular disease. So the conclusions from this study and the highlights were: diabetic individuals with microvascular disease display significant endothelial dysfunction. Number one, endothelial dysfunction in diabetic individuals with microvascular disease further deteriorates after a fat challenge, and postprandial hypertriglyceridemia is an important contributor for further deterioration of this endothelial dysfunction. And it's possible that repeated high insults of high fat meal in diabetic individuals may cause progressive postprandial endothelial dysfunction. And of course, we also found significant correlation with CIMT. So a sounder basis for the atherogenic risk potential of postprandial triglycerides and endothelial dysfunction. And therefore, PPTG appears to be an important and promising risk factor for CAD, especially in diabetes and prediabetes and interventions actually aimed at decreasing them might prove beneficial. What about pre-diabetic subjects? We tried to look at endothelial dysfunction in pre-diabetic subjects who also had first degree relatives as diabetics and showed that group three and group two, both pre-diabetics had greater endothelial dysfunction, but group three, which also had a family history of diabetes had even greater dysfunction. So we concluded that, you know, in response to fat challenge with, um, uh, uh, the TG response is is, uh, is greater 
in pre-diabetic subjects, and there is a greater endothelial dysfunction compared to NGT, especially if they have first degree relatives as diabetics. And therefore, this may contribute to enhanced cardiovascular risk and long-term complications of macrovascular disease in pre-diabetic individuals. And, the, and another angle which was explored was whether you know there is an association between OCP. We all know that OCP has a significant cardiometabolic risk. We also know that now that postprandial triglycerides have enhanced cardiometabolic risk. Now, is it that the two are linked? The hypothesis was that some of the cardiometabolic effects of PPTG may, may be attributable to the lipophilic OCPs, and, and the reverse is also possible. So we studied OCP levels and, and uh, PPTG levels in, in various degrees of glucose intolerant subjects, which was published recently. Broadly, what did we find? We found that you know high levels of both postprandial triglycerides and PPDDE, which is related to DDT consumptions uh, in newly detected diabetes, significant association of the two with each other and with measures of glycemia and insulin resistance. Both suggest two things. One of two things: cardiometabolic risk associated with postprandial hypertriglyceridemia may, may at least in part be due to increase in serum levels of these OCPs, which are lipophilic and hence tend to retain in the presence of postprandial lipids. Alternately, it could be that the higher risk of type 2 DM and CVD secondary to OCP exposures may be because of higher presence of PPTG in the circulation. Other lipid parameters also were explored, LP, PLA2, phospholipid ac um, activity, and shows that probably um, increase in LP, PLA2 activity in early in the disease might also be a cardiovascular risk factor. And also apolipoprotein AV levels could also induce high, uh, oxidative stress in hypertriglyceridemic patients and this could also be one of the risk factors for CAD. Shifting out of lipids, therefore lipids, particularly postprandial lipids and some of the associated co-markers related to triglycerides and some non-related may be some of the novel areas which might explain some of the unexplained excess uh, atherosclerotic risk in diabetic individuals, uh, despite the fact that we know about small LDL triglycerides and so on, but these might be additional uh, risk factors which might account for the enhanced risk. Now, talking of hypogonadism and diabetes mellitus, we know that a third of them, about 33%, have low free testosterone in diabetic subjects, as has been shown by this from uh, Dr. Dandona's group. They also showed, and several studies have shown, that there is a doubling of the risk of CV mortality if you have low testosterone, a 1.4 times higher risk of CV mortality uh, if, if you have a low quartile of uh, testosterone. And in animal models, it's also been shown that testosterone administration reduces atherosclerosis in VCAM1. So there is a close link. In studies, it's also been shown CRP, an inflammatory marker, is significantly higher if you have a hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, double nearly. And therefore, it's possible that CRP values, um, which related to low testosterone, are, 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 are the result or the cause of this enhanced cardiovascular risk. This study also shows that the all-cause mortality as well as CVD-related mortality is much higher in a long-term follow-up study in those who are hypogonadal with diabetes in the long run and who are followed up for over 11 or to 12 years. And you find that all-cause as well as the CVD mortality is, the hazard ratio is about nearly 1.4 times. So all in all, low testosterone does appear to be a cardiovascular risk marker and therefore we embarked on this study where we actually compared hypogonadism levels of testosterone levels, um, or different types, total bioavailable and so on, in patients of diabetes with and without coronary artery disease, and found that you know, hypogonadism was observed in 40% of those who had macrovascular disease with diabetes, 32% of those who had diabetes but no macrovascular disease, compared to only 14% in controls. And an overall positive correlation was also seen between hypogonadism and CAD. So there appears to be a link, and this related to all the testosterone parameters uh, also correlated with body fat percent. So what did we find? We actually found testosterone deficiency in a significant proportion of male type 2 diabetic uh, subjects as earlier, particularly those with evidence of cardiovascular disease. And it's possible, therefore, based on all the studies, including ours, that low testosterone levels actually could contribute to a significantly higher CV risk in subjects with type 2 diabetes mellitus, considering the fact that nearly one third of them actually have low testosterone levels. So in addition to lipids, in addition to the conventional factors, low testosterone is an area to watch and to, 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 to control or treat uh, if, if we have to finally um, um, 
to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease among diabetic subjects. Then this is a novel study again. We looked at CD36 by float cytometric expression in the monocytes, and it seems to associate with atherosclerotic burden in diabetes mellitus. It's a potential non-invasive tool to detect uh, atherosclerosis. It's supposed to be a class two scavenger receptor expressed in monocytes, and it has a role in you know, cellular uptake of LDL, oxidized LDL, and foam cell transformation. And these two properties actually makes it an important biomarker for atherosclerosis. Hence, we embarked on this study. Flow cytometric expression of uh, M monocyte CD36 was evaluated and, and referenced and compared to a reference of an ankle vehicle index in 70 patients of type 2 diabetes mellitus, 40 with and 30 without coronary artery disease, and 30 additional controls who had no, normal glucose tolerance. Diabetes mellitus had significantly higher CD36 expression than normal glucose controls, number one. More importantly, the CD36 expression was significantly higher in diabetics with CAD than those without CAD. And those with poor glycemic control compared to those with good glycemic control. So these are important uh, areas and therefore uh, this expression could be a good biomarker. And if you see the left two, which are the cases and the right two, which are the controls, on the top, uh, these two, you find the increased expression in terms of the amplitude of these histograms. And even here you find that the CD36 expression is more in the cases compared to the controls. What is more important is if you were to look when compared to ABI, when those who had compromised ABI, you, all of them were practically, most of them had significantly higher MC, M, uh, CD36 expression. More importantly, even those where ABI was not compromised, if you see this table at the bottom, compared to the normal glucose to, uh, tolerance, whether it was um, uncompromised uh, ABI CAD negative di diabetic mellitus or CAD positive di diabetes mellitus or all patients with CAD, all of them had a higher MD MCD 36 expression. Therefore, even in the group where ABI was negative, this seems to stratify patients in terms of their atherosclerotic burden and that's where its importance lies. And therefore, we think it's an important uh, biomarker in atherogenesis. It should be playing an important part, even pathophysiologically. It could be a more robust marker than ABI, and it could also stratify patients where ABI is normal. And because it, 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 it elevates commensurate with the conventional clinical pathological risk of atherosclerosis. And lastly, in the last minute or so, the role of AGEs and polymorphisms of AGVs in the development of microvascular or cardiovascular complications type 2 diabetes mellitus, the hypothesis being that polymorphism of the RAID gene could be a useful genetic marker or a clinical tool to predict vascular disease in these patients. In the series of publications, we looked not only at the polymorphisms and its link with uh, AGEs and um, vascular complications, but also the expression of age receptor rage, that is, in, uh, in, in relation to diabetic vascular complications. What did we find? Polymorphism of rage gene have significant effects on AGE levels and PON1 activity, both predisposing to cardiovascular disease. And we actually found these two polymorphisms to be associated with microvascular complications. So it could be useful biomarkers, genetic markers. Expression, we found greater expression in diabetics compared to controls and even greater in diabetics with microvascular disease of the RAGE receptor in the, in the PBMCs and therefore, uh, uh, which correlates with AGE accumulation. And therefore, the expression studies could also not only help us understand atherogenesis in diabetic patients, but also sometimes could prove to be the useful markers. As is shown in this slide, this could be the sequence of events that would be occurring in the age range interactions leading to cardiovascular disease in diabetic patients. So what have we done in the last 15 minutes? Basically, we focused on some of the newer areas and newer markers because traditional risk factors don't seem to explain the entire excess burden of atherosclerotic disease in diabetic patients. And therefore, looking at these unconventional markers, the postprandial lipids, the some of the other unconventional lipids, which may or may not be related to triglycerides, testosterone, which is low or hypogonadism, the monocyte CD36 expression, the age rage receptor complex and its genetic components. These might be useful areas, not only which help us understand the achievement of risk in diabetes, but also some of them could be become useful biomarkers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, it was benevolent of you to share your own personal original work. Okay. So uh, we have got two questions from uh, Dr. Vishal. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Rakesh Sahai, sir. Uh, 
uh, he is asking what will be the hurdles for using the DERP one A inhibitors in humans for large scale studies. I think, uh, sir, partly alluded to that, but maybe sir can please uh, explain again. Yeah. So what we um, saw from the studies was that uh, it does bring about a, a modest increase in beta cell um, uh, regeneration, and when it's combined with uh, GLP-1 analogs, it uh, done, does uh, work uh, better. And uh, since it's a oral uh, molecule, uh, it I mean, I think that's the one which has uh, maximum promise right now. The uh, uh, the harmin harmin is the one which has been studied in amongst those inhibitors. So I think that's the one which is showing promise as of now. But we still need to look at what are the various. Uh, we, we, it's still early days. We can say that you know it will take at least um, uh, five to eight years before we are able to actually have them in clinical practice. It may if things I mean if everything goes well. But uh, this is uh, what is the data right now available. Thank you, sir, for that answer. Uh, another question, again, from Dr. Vishal is for Madhu, sir. Uh, he's asking whether are we taking in the guidelines as must to check uh, in uh, diabetic patients, specifically the PPTG levels? You know, for part of uh, all the guidelines, I think one of the guidelines, I think NICE or somebody does mention a non-fasting triglycerides. They don't specifically say postprandial triglycerides, but they do mention that fasting triglycerides may not be that important and the non-fasting TG levels are probably uh, far more important and, and they may be done and fasting is not important for maybe for reasons, not the reasons that I mentioned, but for other reasons. But uh, specifically targeting postprandial TGs in, in the recommendations are not yet there. We are actually uh, doing a study where we are trying to look at uh, this specifically as a diagnostic marker, a four-hour value single value because what we've done is actually you know every two hours for eight hours which can't be done in clinical practice so we are doing a four hour post um, challenge value and trying to see if that's a good diagnostic marker if that study once it comes out probably be, it will be part of recommendations so if i may ask one question to at this point sir uh, what is the challenge that you're giving for the uh, before you do the four hour value that, that challenge actually is you know it's a standard challenge based on you know uh, uh, fixed amounts of carbohydrate fat and um, protein and cholesterol levels which we have standardized and it's that standardized fat challenges that is being given for all these studies so uh, it's a it's a kind of a mixed meal but it's a standardized mixed meal with more of uh, fat in there. Yeah, with, with more of fat. And the carbohydrates are also there, but I think 20% or 22% only carbohydrate. Thank you. 60% is fat. Fat, yeah. I do not see any other question for now. Uh, so, with the... Uh, uh, with the permission of the speakers, uh, sir, shall we conclude the session early today? Because, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, by concluding it, uh, Rakesh Sahai, sir, just uh, discussed about the DERK one a inhibitors. Along with that, as we are as we are moving in the uh, treatment of diabetes, we initially were the glucocentric. From there, we went into the organ centric, and now the future is about beta cell preservation, as sir alluded very nicely. And as we Madhu, sir. Uh, and discussed about his original work, especially in the PPTG, CD36, and the rage as the markers of atherosclerosis in diabetes. It was indeed a humbling experience to share the screen with uh, a very two senior endocrinologists of India. Uh, thank you, sir. And I would uh, hand over the session back to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank our speakers and uh, Dr. Krishna Mori, sir, and for joining the session on time and a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much, sir. All of you, thank you very much.